Guillermo Gomez Peña. Guillermo, how are you? Thank you so much for coming in today. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be back in Santa Cruz and to be in this wonderful radio station. I love radio. It's one of my passions. So thank you for inviting me. Now, Guillermo, you did radio, is that correct? Have yes. You, yeah. yeah, for many, many years I worked uh, at a show called Crossroads for M NPR, and then I worked for Latino USA, for all things considered, as a kind of uh, border art correspondent. Uh, and I, I have also done experimental radio, no? So every uh, it's my second passion. My first passion is to be on a stage, to be in performance mode, to perform. My second artistic passion is sound art and radio. And Guillermo, you are quite the multimedia artist. You are uh, a writer, a, a theorist for many of us. Uh, you... Um, are an activist, you are doing radical pedagogy. I explain to me, what is radical pedagogy? Well, um, in the last 10 years, our main... I have a troupe called La Pocha Nostra. It's a completely interdisciplinary troupe. It, it has been a haven for disgruntled dancers and actors who want to escape from the vertical structures of theater and dance and from the authority of the director and the choreographer. It has been also a, a haven for poets who want to utilize their own bodies, for electronic musicians who want to add a performative dimension to their presentations. So it's a very quirky and wonderful association of rebel artists from several countries. And uh, for many years, we felt that the ultimate project was the actual performance. But in the last 10 years, we have been shifting. We have discovered that by involving local communities in the artistic process by uh, inviting them to undergo the process of actually constructing a performance, there is a profound transformation in their psyche and their sensibilities. And uh, we realized that what we were doing was a kind of feral or radical type of performance pedagogy, education. So we started a summer school in Oaxaca in 2004, and artists from all over the world began to come in the summers to collaborate with local indigenous artists from Oaxaca. Then that summer school became nomadic, we began to take it to different countries and always under the same premise. Uh, half of the participants are local and the other half are international. And our goal is to create transnational communities that are sustainable of rebel artists and hopefully to inspire them to create collectives in their own countries and cities and it's been very empowering f both for them and also for us. So yes, nowadays, every time I'm invited to, to a residency, I demand, I require to incorporate a workshop. And this is precisely what we're gonna be doing this week here in Santa Cruz. And that's right. You are. Uh, you started last night. You gave a talk about your, your history of your art. You uh, came to the United States in 1978 after studying art at UNAM. You were born in Mexico City, and when you came here, you continued studying your arts, uh, and you started working on uh, what many would say an uh, artistic and intellectual 
body of work that explores borders, uh, the physical, the body, uh, the identity. And some actually call you a Chicano punk shaman performance artist. <laughs> <laughs> Would you agree with that type of... <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's an honor to be called that. <laughs> although I feel that shamans and performance artists, although we share many strategies, uh, we have different goals, no? Their goal is to heal, to, and our goal is to... maybe raise disturbing, uncomfortable questions, to shatter the sense of the familiar of the audience, to ask the questions that no one else is asking. So we have slightly different goals, but I have always been inspired by shamans. Every time I go back to Mexico, I try to engage in an ongoing dialogue with shamans and to observe their practice. They are masters of uh, ritual art. And you are a master of ritual art as well. This is Artist on Art. I am speaking with the fabulous Guillermo Gomez Peña. Guillermo is a performance artist, writer, activist, radical, pedagogue, and director of the performance troupe La Pocha Nostra. He uh, performs and writes and he debates on cultural diversity, border culture, and U.S.-Mexico relations. His artwork has been presented in over 800 venues across the U.S., the world. And he is a MacArthur Fellow, Bessie, and an American Book Award winner. And he is a regular contributor, as he was saying earlier, to NPR and many newspapers and magazines in the U.S., Mexico, and Europe. You're based in San Francisco, is that correct? Exactly. Uh, one foot is in San Francisco and the other foot is in Mexico City. And actually, I would say that my sense of home is very strange. Whenever people tell me, where is home? I respond, I have a personal Bermuda Triangle. Home is somewhere between San Francisco, Mexico City, and wherever I am touring at the time. Because I would say that 40% of the year, I am on the road you know, performing from city to city, from country to country, crossing borders, engaging with different communities, sometimes alone and other times with my troupe. It's a kind of nomadic life that I love passionately. And you've been doing this for quite a while. Uh, you have traveled with many extraordinary artists, such as Coco Fusco in the early 90s. You did an extraordinary piece together, The Couple in the Cage, which has an incredible documentary. If anyone is interested in seeing it, you uh, traveled as if you, you embodied the persona of a couple that had been found uh, on an island off of Mexico that had been untouched by modern humans, and you performed what how a person would react to modern life, and you were uh, chained and taken into cages in museums across the U.S., sometimes very well received, sometimes understood completely, like in New York, <laughs> sometimes not like Chicago at the Art Institute, where people, some people were so offended of seeing humans treated as animals, as you and Coco Fusco portrayed, and then were equally as upset when they heard that they had been spoofed <laughs> and that this was an art project. Um, do you look back at that time and feel like we've moved on in some ways? Ay, 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 what a pertinent question. In many ways we have, but at the same time, I look at the state of U.S.-Mexico relations and I, I observe uh, with discomfort the kind of anti-immigration hysteria and the rabid xenophobia, um, 
the new immigration laws, the criminalization of migrant workers, and uh, and I go. There is a. We are back in many ways to where we were in the pre civil rights era almost. Uh, I used to think 10 or 15 years ago that my border art period would be over one day and that I would have the privilege to move on to other issues, to explore globalization and explore new technologies and many other pertinent issues that are part of my work. But here we are in 2014, and I am often speaking about the same issues I used to speak 20 years ago, fear of the Mexican other. A couple of weeks ago, a politician made a connection between immigration, Ebola, and terrorism. I couldn't believe my ears. So, uh, no, uh, today more than ever, artists have to perform the role of critical, moral voices holding the mirror to power, to reflect the distorted features of power. We have to perform the role of informal ombudsmen and monitor the behavior of our governments and institutions. <clears throat> we need to go back to the streets, but we also need to be in the media. We need to be in the educational institutions and also in the art world. The art world is an important laboratory to inhabit. The art world allows me to develop radical models that later on will have to be tested somewhere else. You know, so I always go back to the art world, but for me, really, the ultimate goal is the territory that I wish to inhabit is multi-contextual. It is right now speaking in the radio. It is next week demonstrating in San Francisco or in Mexico City. And it is also this week at the university engaged in a residency uh, trying to to bring provocative art and provocative thought to the young students. I am particularly interested in the young students. Last night, for example, we had about 150 students whose ages ranged from 18 to 21. They didn't know what performance art. They didn't know about my work. And it was quite a challenge to reach their souls. But for me, that was the political project, you know, to show them that it is important for a brown artist to survive from his art, to exercise his freedom of speech. You know, I wanted them to get engaged to, you know, and I was so touched by their response. So Guillermo Gomez Peña, he is here on the UCSC campus this week. He is here because um, since October 3rd and running through December 6th, he is a part of a Cessnan gallery exhibition called Documentado Undocumented Ars Shamanica Performitica, and it is the outcome of a seven-year collaboration uh, that features Guillermo Gomez Peña's performance texts Felicia Rice's Relief, Prints, and Typography, accompanied by Jennifer Gonzalez's Critical Commentary, video by Gustavo Vasquez, an altar, a cabinet of curiosities, and interactive sound art by Zachary Watkins. This is the greatest book I've ever seen in my life. It's 30 feet long. And I've had the privilege to see it in various uh, renditions. And so I've been able to, and it's just been an amazing, amazing honor to see how this 
art piece, multimedia um, has come together. In fact, Jennifer Gonzalez will be speaking tonight at the Cessnon Gallery at, at 5 p.m. about the work that they've done that is shown at the Cessnon Gallery. Um, Guillermo, uh, you, uh, how do you... How do you like the book? <laughs> oh, I am completely, completely amazed by the result. You know, for me, collaboration is an act of citizen diplomacy. You know, I'm very much interested in the role of art in a democracy and in collaboration as a form, as a vernacular kind of type of diplomacy. Uh, I engage in multiple collaborations with artists from many and intellectuals from many communities. Uh, throughout the years, I have worked with uh, Reverend Billy, with uh, Native American artists such as James Luna, uh, with Coco Fusco, with some, you know, with Tania Bruguera, the Cuban artist. Uh, this particular collaboration is really close to my heart because it involves a, a group of intellectuals and artists coming from very, very different backgrounds. An art historian, a filmmaker, an electronic musician, a book artist, and a writer and performance artist. We have been... <coughs> <clears throat> Perdón, we have been engaged in this collaboration for seven years, cooking the book at low fire, meeting maybe every three months, sometimes in my studio in San Francisco, other times here. And finally, after seven years of discussions, debates, brainstorming sessions, gatherings around food and wine, we are witnessing the results. Yeah. You know, it is a kind of one of the many possible futures for bookmaking. Now that bookmaking is in crisis, and we are facing the probable extinction of the binded book, of the book as an object, uh, and the possibility that all the publishing houses become digital, we, in response to this, we are going back to the very origins of bookmaking, not to the way books used to be made hundreds of years ago, no. By hand, on a press, in Felicia's house. <laughs> Absolutely. Guillermo is also going to be doing a performance at the dark at the Digital Arts Research Center at 8 o'clock p.m. on Thursday. It is going to be Imaginary Activism, the role of the artist beyond the art world. This is a free performance, but it is sold out and space is limited. So arrive early if you want to get a seat. Guillermo will be performing. Would you mind giving us a taste of uh, your, your performance? Yes, I would like to tell you a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about, no? <clears throat> you know, I've been obsessed with hope. In the last three or four years, no, uh, where are we going to draw our spiritual energy from in order to continue fighting, reforming, uh, engaging in the civic realm, so I'm going to read an excerpt from a larger piece that will be part of the performance. No, carnales, I won't celebrate politicians anymore. The fact is I don't believe in government. I don't think it is possible to correct the problem from within the system. We have all tried. It doesn't work. The system is the problem. I'm 
politics is the art of manipulating the system to perpetrate problems. Being a radical within the system is a mere prestidigitation act, part of the spectacle of radicalism that media consumers require to feel alive and authenticate their extreme designer identities. In my world, the battles I would propose as political candidates are not even politicians. They are artists and literati, visionaries, not functionaries. The country I would like to live in only exists in planet poetry and planet performance, where imagination is the only law. Art is part of everyday life, and everyone practices what they believe. Imagination is my nation. That's where I wish to live and die. The crucial question here is, again, where does one find the spiritual energy to continue when you don't believe in mainstream politics and institutionalized religion gives you the creeps? What to do when you are too old to belong to a subculture and participate in the global rave and too strange to get a chic job in academia? Where do we locate our dissent when dissent is a corporate product, an HBO special, a perfume, the scent of dissent, an chic, extreme, suicide? Or when kids can simply wear a t-shirt that says, art is resistance, and think the job is done? What to do when all the master discourses and epic narratives of hope are bankrupt? Which is the best energy drink? Do male enhancers really work? Since 9-11, as my metahorizons began to fade, I became obsessed with hope, esperanza, with finding its spiritual source and location. Is hope a deep feeling of expansion located on the chest, the abdomen, or the sphincter? Is it a distant marker in the horizon that directs our actions or a mysterious spiritual energy that propels you into the unknown against the laws of gravity? Is hope a matter of quantum theory, a form of poetic will? Is hope by definition illogical and unreasonable? Can hope be nurtured through education? Does hope put you at odds with the state? These are some of the questions I'm going to be tackling on Thursday. And again, that is a pretty well, uh, it's going to be well attended. Uh, there's a limited amount of seats. If you want to get there, you need to get early if you want to be able to see the show. And Guillermo Gomez Peña um, will be talking about these issues and the role of the artist in activism. You are also giving a workshop on Friday. You mentioned earlier that whenever you do these kinds of things, uh, you make it a priority to have a workshop. Um, again, this has been already sold. It's already full. Um, but for those of us who maybe get to go, we'll try to come to the next one. Tell us what will somebody be able to expect? Workshops <clears throat> try to make performance accessible. Uh, to demystify the notion that performance artists are irresponsible troublemakers, you know, and that we're constantly interested in creating extreme images just for the hell of it. So uh, these workshops basically propose the following. The workshop space is a micro-universe of the social world. And the human body becomes a metaphor for the political body. So if I can cross with respect, with dignity, with radical tenderness, if I can cross sensitive borders in the workshop space, borders that have to do with race, gender, age, profession, generation, I may be inspired to cross them in the civic realm. That is basically the premise of this pedagogy in a nutshell. <laughs> that is fantastic. Guillermo Gomez-Pena, 
Thank you so much for taking your time to come up here at KZSC and talking with us on Artist on Art. It's an absolute honor. Thank you immensely for hosting me.